Right on, buddy boarders. Welcome back to another week. Lads, JD. JD, how's Melbourne? Good. Melbourne is going well, mate. All good over here. How are you? JD's going to be back in the flesh next week, Money Miners, and I can't wait to touch his face. Trav, <laughs> mate, gee, she's, mate, in, in the mining world rocking today, mate. We're going, we're, we're leading off with a bit of uranium. Hell yeah, mate. We don't, oh, no, we don't mind it. There's a bit going on in the US. and there absolutely is. There's will, stuff going on everywhere. Will mate. the Kremlin put the foot down? But tell you what, uranium people might find exciting, but Jesus Christ. How good is HPA? I'm not high sure. Pu- I'm not <laughs> sure yet. Jury's, high purity out. alumina. Far holy snap induction. Jade is going to convince us going. why it's uh, just I'm, as interesting. I'm going to try make one of the most niche products that we speak about exciting, Maddie. So you can judge me afterwards on whether you think it's exciting or not. If JD's interested in it, the money miners are interested in it. That's all that matters. Patriot raising some bucks. A they are. Bit, uh, it's, it's yeah. Sort, yeah, it's sort of a it's a bit different, isn't it? It's, it's, the structure's a bit funky, but yeah. yeah. yeah raising some money. A- ASX investors involved. Um, interesting. And then I went to the Metals X AGM ah. as well. Maddie, the only shareholder in the room. That wasn't a board member. Yeah, bloody joking me. Oh, geez, they would have they would have started <laughs> sweating in the boots once they see Big Rick Ardinio walk in. Let's get into it. As you've seen, no, no better, no, no more pertinent people to have on the thumbnail than Biden and Putin than talking about US uranium <laughs> bill and the uh, is the Kremlin going to put their put their bloody foot down? So let's do a bit of a recap because I don't think we've actually properly covered it, but it's all piecing together now. Last week, and it's been in the mix for a while, Mr. Joe Biden, the old fossil himself, signed the <laughs> he signed the bill to ban the import of Russian enriched uranium into the US, fully effective by yeah. 2028. So I saw these headlines, Matty, and I'm glad you can break it down for me because I, I need I need it to be broken down for me. That's what I'm here for, boys. Uh, now, by until 2028, from now till then, because there's, you know, legacy contracts and everything, there will be uh, waivers available. But there's a bit going on there because – For those who don't know, so Russia supplies about a quarter of the uranium, uh, enriched uranium that is used in the US nuclear reactors. So it's by far the biggest uh, import they need to do for the enriched uranium that's not actually enriched within the US. So Russia's a big part of US nuclear power. Yep. So with this bill, as I said, the US utilities, uh, i.e. the people, that the companies that own, run the reactors, Yep, they can receive waivers uh, allowing the import of this Russian enriched uranium until 2028 if they literally cannot source the EUP from anywhere, anywhere else. else. Anywhere. EUP is enriched uranium. Gotcha. So if, if they can source it, does not matter how much they have to pay for it, like if there's import tariff, if it comes from China or anything, like it does not matter – too bad they have to pay it. It's purely if they, they can get it or not. Gee, what an opportunity for a competitor. Because mm. so the now the what's come out more like in between now and when this uh, bill got signed was that the Russian state-owned, I guess, enriched uranium supply, 10X, which is uh, – that's owned by Rosatom. It's state-owned. Has – they've they've effectively said if the US utilities – don't secure one of these waivers within 60 days from now, they will force, they use the words force majeure any yep. existing orders from like legacy contracts. So, you know what that means? Not going to send the EUP to the US. So, they're. Yeah. Force majeure is when I think, I'm pretty sure it just means like you can't actually, um, you you cannot meet your contractual obligations. Yeah. It's bloody, yeah. So, it's a bad thing. Mm. So, <laughs> and because, but the interesting thing was, from what I hear, that I don't think the, I don't think the, like this, becomes law until eighty or ninety days from now. The US ban, but they're wanting the waivers within the next sixty days. So it's a bit. Yeah, that's a that, that's interesting from what I've heard. So, Maddie, I know you would have been just watching a thousand uranium videos over the weekend. What what was the like the TLDR on on what what this all means? Oh, okay. Well, buddy. Well, Old Hooney did a good one on yep. Uranium Insider. A lot of good info in that one. So, the pretty, pretty, and like what he, his sort of hypothesis or his sort of speculation was thinking that 10X wouldn't 
want to send all the ura- enriched uranium over to the US and then have it not let in. They wouldn't bloody chuck it on a bloody ship, send it over, and then, like, it gets there because it takes a while to get there. And then they say, oh, no, you don't have a waiver. You've got to frigging send it back. And or he, and he also said they, they might see this as a bit of a possible out because these legacy contracts with, uh, with Russia probably done at a lot lower prices because, you know, back in the day when there was, you know, shitload of uranium and not as much getting used. So the landscapes changed a bit. So... Um, it's, it's one of them things. How they, if Russia supply twenty percent, how are they going to get the AUP? If I guess Kremlin just friggin' like ten X might say they want to do it, but if the Kremlin says, which is ten X is owned by the bloody Russia, then the Kremlin says, nah, bugger it, we want waivers. Otherwise, until twenty twenty eight, we're just not sending you anything at all. Um, and that that was talked about before this actually come in. So. It's, yeah, and as in the enrichment world, like the spot enrichment is freaking bugger all by the sounds, very, very thin because as we know in uranium, everything's bloody tied up in contracts. Majority of stuff is tied up in contracts. So to have to find an enricher that's going to sell into the enrichment spot market, going to be pretty hard. And look, if you use China as an example – They've, they've got enrichment capacity. A lot of it, by the sounds, supplies their own nuclear reactors. I think they've got friggin' oh, 50 or 90. They've got shitloads. Yeah, yeah. shitloads over there. So, but if they, if they said, right, we can't get it from Russia, uh, sorry, if it's available from China, technically that's available. So they would have to get that because they can't get Russian stuff unless there is nothing available. But if there's spot EUP available from China, they'd have to pay 30% import tariff on it, the US, because of the import um, the import duty levy for China. So that'll cost them a shitload. Um, yeah, but as I said, as per these waivers, that is not the US government's problem if the utilities have to pay shitloads to get that uranium from China or friggin' wherever. So if they're going to go Western, which is Arano and Uranko, Arano is the French, Uranko is the, I think it's, what is it, German, Dutch, British? Um, enrichment company or just bloody up downstream uranium company. The difference is there with compared to the the original legacy contracts with Russia is that you got the enriched uranium from Russia and then once you got it, you then had to give them the UF6, which is the UF6 is in between yellow cake and enriched uranium. That's the gas that's fed into the centrifuges to – commence the enrichment process. But with Arano and Uranko, you have to actually purchase the UF6 first, give it to them, and then they enrich it. So it's bringing forward the requirement if you go through them to get the UF6. And then by the sounds, to buy converted uranium is – there's doesn't sound like there's much out there at the moment that's just – sitting on the shelf that you can just go and grab and just, yeah. So that's an extremely right. thin market that's all tied up as well. So who are the, who are the, the winners and losers from, from that implication, Matty? Well, it's, it's more just like, how's this all going to work? Where's it going to come from? Like, it's just, there's, it's, it just looks like lo- levels of bottlenecks right. everywhere. Um, might be just like bloody price goes up and everyone works harder. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure, but I guess. And the the other thing about the going through Arano and Uranko, remember uh, Mr. Mike Olkin talking about the tails grade mm. of the tails assay going through the enrichers. So a lower tail in the enricher means you need less uranium to feed into it to create the same amount. A higher tail means you need more uranium to create the same amount of enriched uranium. So the Russian enrichment ones are at like a tails grade of two, tails assay of two, which is the lower end, which means you need less uranium to go in there because it's spinning it for longer. Whereas Arano and Uranko, they're saying the tails – the contracts there, the tails grade assays will be around maybe up to three, which three to two means you need 20% more uranium 
to create the same amount of enriched uranium because you're not spinning it for as long. So that's another. So you need. So they're needing to pull forward, possibly pull forward, uh, getting the UF6 pulling forward conversion. Then they might need more uranium to actually create the rich uranium. So there's, oh, mate, there's just shitloads happening here. So, so it's, uh, it's shaping up to be extremely interesting. If, if the Kremlin put the foot down and require these waivers within 60 days and if they don't get them, potentially cut off the enriched uranium supply to the US before it even comes to law and mm. you would, that'll probably drive the price of enriched uranium up. Um, and they'll have to find the UF-6 to feed these Western enrichers much sooner than they anticipated with the legacy Russian contracts. Um, There's a million be heaps of incentives for, I suppose, like, you know, Western-aligned en en enrichment mm. alternatives as well. Is well, it? and that, like what this, what this law did by signing it unlocked that I think, US $2.7 billion worth of funding that the US government is putting into – Enrichment, okay. Uh, uh, it, conversion and enrichment facilities within the US. Yeah. So that that is going to be that is going to benefit on the enrichment side because there's only one one commercial enrichment facility in the US in New Mexico operated. It's owned by Uranco. Okay. So Arana, do you, do you know about that, that financing is that incentive financing is that a, a grant to a particular player? No, I think it's going to. It sounds like they'll be applying for it across the board. Yeah. So you're going to have yeah. – so, yeah, and then like Arano, they were – I think they were previously going to build an enrichment facility in – I think it was Idaho um, back in – like, but then Fukushima happened and it all just got canned after that. So they're studying at the moment to build another more enrichment capacity in US. There's um, Centris, I think. They've got, they got like a pilot plant there that they're using to uh, create – uh, they're they're producing Halo, the high enriched uranium for the SMRs, but all their all their enriched uranium, they most of by the sounds that they're using to create that Halo is sourced from Russia. So they're they'll be applying for a waiver, and then in the conversion side of it, like Convadine's the the main one in the big one, the the one conversion facility in the US, which is Honeywell and Global Atomic. Yep, I think, um, and then you have got. Silex Cameco, they've got the JV to um, for that laser enrichment. So they're the parties that'll be seeking this <clears throat> some of that two point seven billion to get this enrichment happening. But just just in my head, mm. in the short term, it's like the sh the short term issue of this is like right if they just cut off twenty five percent of the uranium supply, enrich uranium supply right now from Russia. If Russia's don't Russia don't get these waivers, it's like it's more fragility in the system. Mate, if you cut off twenty five percent of anything, anywhere, like it just creates turmoil. Yeah, when I lost twenty five percent of my hairline, I, I was pretty upset. Yeah, it's bloody maniac. <laughs> yeah, imagine, imagine if you cut off JD. Imagine if you cut off twenty five percent of friggin' mine site power installations provided by Silverstone. Could you Mate, imagine if I was that? running a mine, I'd be shitting myself, but there is only one person to call in that what, case. What do you think would happen? Well, I could tell you, price of solar farms would go up, price of diesel generator installations would go up, EV charging stations, they're, they're going up, hybrid power stations, they're, they're going up. Because, like, you know, Silverstone's taken over the frigging mine site power site like industry that much that they're pretty much – they. They control where that needle is moved, so they. At, at least you'd know, Matty. You'd be in the safest hands possible. Yeah, you barely I'm have not, to worry. Well, I just you're think looking after you. Yeah, well, my the company mine sites need to understand. Like, if you don't use Silverstone and you take them out of the market, those prices are just going to go up. Like, they're pretty much a metaphor for Russian enriched uranium. So okay. just just do the do the safe option and friggin' use them. Food for thought, Matty. So. A lot of the mo mining Did you we see do. How scared or look yeah, in your face you look and thinking what would happen. Look for you. Yeah. You look scared. A lot of the mining we do is 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 for energy. Like when, what we mine copper, we mine lithium. It's all for energy, right? Now Silverstone literally sought out the power and energy solution mm. for mining in order so so that we can sustain our the energy that we need. It's like a circular circular thing. If you think yeah, about yeah. It. It's like circular. <laughs> like if you take Silverstone out, you get that circular reference warning. Like you get in Excel, it's just shit. Guard just doesn't work. Anyway. Um, could someone explain 
for a bloke that appears that he wants to save the world, why does Twiggy hate uranium so much? <laughs> See the, the the article in the director's special this morning. Yeah, he's just bloody. I don't get it, mate. I don't understand. I don't get it. I know he's been a big backer of um of of hydrogen, and I can't help but think there's a bit of saving face going on here. Given well, your he public... goes, as soon as he promotes uranium, it takes yeah. away from his hydrogen yeah. ambitions. and I mean, it but must be like, as simple as that. Like, there's like year one math to do to figure out that like, okay, what's your, like, there's like you know a popularized metric called energy return on investment. What? How much? How much energy do you have to expend to get, um, a, you know, a, 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 the maximize your bloody return on energy investment? And like uranium knocks it out of the park, hydrogen doesn't. Like it's year one math, Twiggy. Give up, Twiggy. Give up. Or just get into uranium, <laughs> mate. Get into it. It's well, what the capex is huge. Yes, upfront, but cost. it fucking goes for eighty years yeah. for a plant or more. Just think of the energy density. Yeah, of uranium too. It's like, okay, you need this tiny little amount and they're just bloody, yeah. Anyway, it's, it's just like, it's not that hard to fathom. Mate, need to change FFI to FFU. <laughs> 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 we'll get him on the show to chat about it. Oh, I could see that happening. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, speaking of uh, things that are just intense, Alpha HPA. Far out. <laughs> Holy snap and duck shit. What's going on here, boys? All right, fellas, strap yourselves in. I've gone I've gone pretty deep on oh. this one. I'm not sure how much you knew about Alpha HPA or A4N. Nothing. Fuck all. I know it <laughs> right, consistently we- gets gets labelled as um as underrated, but we do like overrated, underrated. Uh, pe- people are interested in in this. It's a yeah, it's a stock that's Got a got a lofty valuation and a, and a lot of support. A four N. There's a lot of wannabe, um, a, you know, uh, high purity kind of competitors that have some Kalen thing. But there's, I think there's nuance to it all, isn't there? Absolutely, mate. So let's let's start from the the real basics and sort of build it up. So they're a nine hundred and thirty million dollar company before the financing that's taken place today. But it's been a pretty big day for the company. We've got the DFS coming out. Announced FID and financing coming together for the HPA first project stage two. It's a it's a bit of a stupid name, but essentially stage <laughs> one for first project was the the pilot plant, and stage two is what they're pressing go on here. And it's pretty cool to see all three come together. It's a it looks well executed on that front. So I think the money miners will be on a, a bit of a learning journey with us as we get up to speed. But I think there's a real hook and it's obviously niche what they're doing, but the the hook is that the margins that these guys can earn if it comes through are are pretty phenomenal. So let's, let's walk through the details. Start us off with a DFS, mate. What, like, what what are we looking at here? All right, mate. So in March, 2020, the, the initial DS came out, DFS rather, and this is an update. So stage two, like I said, this is full commercial scale deployment of their tech Stage one has been up and running for 16 odd months and they're going to produce these aluminium based specialty materials. So you've got HPA, high purity alumina nitrate, HPA trihydrate and three other of these niche uh, materials. And they're used in semiconductors, they're used in batteries, they're used in LED lighting. So essentially what they're targeting is a high value product at the end of the day. The CapEx is $553 million. Now, here's where it sort of gets interesting. Their weighted average sales price is a bit over 34 bucks a kilo, and the cash cost is just under $10 a kilo. 4.4 year payback period from first production. I don't like seeing a payback period from first production. Way rather see it from when you start to put the money into the ground, but that's just a side note. And then you've got steady state productions being achieved from only FY30, but they're at 87% capacity in three years, and that's a year after first production. So it's not actually perhaps as far away as it might first seem. And the clear distinction here, guys, is it took me a sort of second to click, but reading through this, there's no mine life. It's it's so different to what we read every day, but it doesn't just end when the ore body kind of ends. So that that took a, a second or two to get used to. Why Why is that, JD? Explain that. Because they're building a factory to get feedstock and produce something. Ah. It's more of an industrial business with a bit of yeah. te- technical risk backed into it. Yeah, right. Is exactly. It, so the, 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 the bit that the, the first thoughts I have, and I'm sure you're going to answer this, is like 
commodity I've never heard of. So do I believe the the, the assumed price? And I'm sure you're going to get to that. That is, yeah, the, the way I sort of walk through it is what, what are the costs? Are the assumptions real and what are the prices? But before I jump into that, we'll just go through the financing that came together today because it was pretty chunky and it was super, super friendly. So they announced a bit uh, previously, but they've got credit approved, 320 million bucks from NAIF and EFA, so the, the government essentially, our taxpayer money, plus an $80 million cost overrun facility from the same people. So all up 400. Then you've got an underwritten placement, $120 million at a pretty tidy 10% discount. And they're doing an additional SPP. Kind of weirdly, they didn't state how much they want to raise from the SPP. So that's up at their discretion. Then you've got government grants of $67 million. So if you assume $30 million in the SPP, we're talking about $620 million in total financing there Oof. or 540 if you don't include the cost overrun facility. But a huge amount of taxpayer money going toward it just made me even more intrigued because, you know, you want to know if our money is being spent appropriately. So very generous 11-year term on that essentially $400 million coming from NAIF and EFA and with a pretty clear condition that they can only draw down the debt once they've secured letters of intent for 10,000 tonnes per annum, which is essentially 100% of production capacity. So if those things come together, that'd be a pretty huge tick of approval in you know in the next few months or so. God, bloody mineral sands or HPA, geez, that's where you get some attractive financing, isn't it? <laughs> well, uh, rare, mineral sands if it's rare earth, earth. not, not it's, if it's just mineral uh, sands. Oh, yeah, no, sorry, <laughs> rare earth for a mineral sands company. Critical minerals. Critical, yeah. critical minerals, yeah. bloody attractive. Yeah. Do they have attractive insurance? Mate, I was trawling through, command effing all the various documents that came out today, and I didn't see insurance. So there's a there's a gaping hole as a prospective Fuck, investor. That's a you know, CRE, you, you want to see. CRE insurance jobby, don't you think, JD? It's got a CRE's name all over oh, it, Matty. Yeah, that's bloody. This they should be on this insurance ticket. Off. Yeah, it's up in up in Queensland. This is up in Gladstone. That's their, in their, that's their wheelhouse, isn't it, JD? It's their neck of the woods, mate. No, Bread and it, butter. It, no, what? Have a, I'll, I'll even bring up the blokes I'm talking about. Have a look at this. Trust. Just I'll look at that and just think trust. Have a look at have a look at the weapons behind CRE. You know, Trav, you've dealt with insurance people. You know they give off that vibe sometimes, like that bit of I'm just I'm gonna take you for a bit of a ride. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've, I've I've never felt that way about, you know, Dave Adam or Steve. No, no. Do you know, Dave, they all met each other when they were doing charity work back in the day, and from that they started an insurance firm? That, that doesn't surprise me at all. Yeah. Can yeah, you think just... of an insurance crew with a pedigree, like with a charitable background that, like, could you trust them even more? They're pretty, they're pretty much bloody philanthropists. Were they teaching, you know, insurance basics to the innumerate? Like, yeah, for youth? free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. doing God's work. Yeah, so – Mate, anyone at this sort of feasibility study stage that we're talking about with bloody hey, uh, the old Alpha HP, what are, what are they fucking called? HPA, mate. HPA. <laughs> Alpha H- No, Alpha, what's the company called? HPA. It's just HPA. Alpha HPA. Alpha yeah, HPA. The ticker, oh, yeah. The ticker is A4N, so it's yeah. a bit oh. confused. Do you know why the ticker is A4N? It's because you, oh. you refine it to um, four. Yeah. And like, so it's like yeah. 99.9999, those four nines is the yeah. percent. Uh, mate, they're Illumina. close because everything, everything's four and five, everything's written at. So that's 9999995. Yeah. So they want to go one step further. Oh, there we go. Yeah, change the ticker to A5 in. I'm going to, I'm going to leave that all in. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so anyone, anyone like Alpha HBA. <laughs> That's bloody uh, in doing any sort of big long document to study something. Fucking CRE. Jesus Christ. No brainer. Mm. So um, all, all, wrapping up the financing there, guys, there's one more thing to note. The budget came out last week and there was a big carve out for critical critical minerals processing. So I know I already said they got 67 bucks from the government, but I'm sure they'd be working their ass off to get another handout because, I mean, why wouldn't you if, you're there, if they're handing all the money out? So- to walk you guys through my thinking, like you sort of said there, Trav, we're interested in the costs and the pricing and these sorts of things. So it's pretty simplistic, but I think it's a good way to go about it. I wanted to get sort of certainty around the production process, i.e. the costs, 
you know, to see how proven the process is, to see what the input costs are, what the drivers of those costs are, and, you know, what your margin of safety, if you're not operating quite as cheaply as you want to, is. And then on the sales side, you know, you want confidence that they've spoken with end users, that they're going to be able to achieve the prices that they've set out in their assumptions. You want to see if there's any sort of sales contracts, what the end market kind of size is, do they have any pricing power? So pretty simple, you know, P P times Q just minus your costs type of analysis that we're doing. Yep. Um, You got me curious, mate. On on your point on the the government stuff, isn't there like a 10% production tax credit sort of comparable to the IRA? Like surely that would be applicable to to this is downstream processing, right? I I would think so. I can't can't say with confidence, but I'd imagine these guys, uh, you know, working at chopping off even more of that OPEX and making that margin even even wider. So, I mean, on... On the cost sides, like I said, they've been running it for 16 months, essentially a pilot plant, and they've produced various smaller amounts of each of the products that they want to produce. Stage two, like I said, it's targeting a bit over 10,000 tonnes per annum. And the company's gone out and said, you know, the scale-up risks are pretty low. So, you know, we don't we don't always take the company's word for that, but worth looking into more. The, the trick to what they're doing here is this proprietary solvent extraction tech for aluminium extraction and purification. That's the the foundation upon the process that they've built out here. They say it's 10 plus years of process development has gone into it and that they've got twenty year a 20 year term with exclusive access. So this isn't a mining flow sheet. They source this alumina trihydrate, which is the feedstock from Rio in the Gladstone area. And that's the, the differentiator from the incumbent processes out there, which are way more energy intensive you've also got the other key input these reagents and they come from literally next door you can see them in the photos from an orica facility now this is the biggest opex line item it's one third of their operating costs so it's super important and they've secured a a reagent supply contract as well as a a byproduct agreement to go literally straight back out to orica and then the other sort of item you look out for is the the utilities, the water and the energy, and that makes up 15% of the OPEX. They discuss trying to lock in renewable power, plus they're connecting to the Queensland gas pipeline up there in Gladstone. And like plenty of industrial processes, energy intensity is important and energy prices, you know, therefore important. So you want to make sure it's all tickety on those fronts. So kind of getting this far, everything sounded pretty intriguing and it sounds like they're onto something. But you know, you, you hear the words proprietary technology, and I'm not sure about you guys, but I see those words in a flow sheet and I get nervous. Alarm bells start going off. I always prefer a flow sheet that is super proven and simple and straightforward. You always want to be this- the second at doing something, Jada. <laughs> in mining, exactly. yes, but this isn't in quite mining. mining. This mm. is like, yeah. Yeah. This is fun. so. You know, regardless, super intrigued. So, you know, you know we, keep, we keep digging from here. And you look at the the five different types of products that they want to produce, these HBA products, and their stage one has produced four of them at you know a much smaller scale, but they've produced them, which is a, a good check. And the, the fifth one is making up a very small amount of the, the final output. So it's kind of good on that front. And they've also built in a bit of flexibility around these products, you know, the ones that might target semi-end uses or the ones that might target battery or lighting end uses. And there's a bit of flexibility so that they can sort of scale up and down depending on the market opportunities and which ones have a bit more demand to an extent. Now, with all this in mind, you know, they've got scale up risk getting to that 10.4 thousand tonnes per annum, but I think the company's done what they kind of can to prove it out. I don't like how they only show the cash costs, but you can kind of back out from the free cash flow calc that sustaining capital is, is pretty small. So, you know, the, the implications are that that's a relatively small number and the, the costs beyond the cash costs are uh, quite quite small. Then you get to the pricing side. And like I said, not a standard fungible commodity. It's a, special, a specialty material. And at the beginning of May, they released a document showing all the work that they'd done on the pricing front and where the assumptions had come from. So they've done a bunch of things. They've spoken with consultants and got consultant forecasts that sort of one way in which they've gone about it, then they've done some market research, outreach, letters of intent. So essentially just engaging people that could potentially buy the product. They've spoken with distribution agents, 
they've got real niches. So they might be lithium batteries in Southeast Asia or HPA salts focused. And they've indicated what sort of prices on what sort of volumes they'd be likely to pay. And all up, they've done 220 of these test samples going to 125 different end users. So no sales contracts locked in yet to give confidence, but they've got six letters of intent from different end users accounting for about 22% of their stage two supply. So like I said, they need to get that up to 10,000 tonnes to be able to draw down on their debt. And they've got many multiples of that in various stages of negotiations. Well, this is interesting, right? Because normally <clears throat> normally it's pretty hard to announce FID of something if, if you don't have a good portion of your supplier contracted. But what, what you're saying is that's that's not the case here. Yeah, exactly. So okay. 22% is spoken for through letters of intent. And, you know, letters of intent aren't the, you know, the, the most secure type of contract out there. So that that sort of speaks to the the debt condition that they need to get to 100%. Uh, still via letters of intent, not, not, not an off-take? Yeah. Oh, wow. No, not, not off-takes. That's, so, that's super. Yeah, un, 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 unusual is the word I'd use. Yeah. Like, Nothing, Look, mate. Non-binding MOUs everywhere. <laughs> Bloody piece of cake. You uh, can get it, them easy. Yeah, but they've got. You can you can see in one of the charts we'll flash up now that they've got many many multiples of production capacity in various stages of negotiation. But again, these are these are early sort of stages. So do you know not secure? Do you know what like um, what the total market size is is for the product? Like, are they? It's it's not one of those like niche products where you know, oh well and good but you're actually going to produce like sixty percent of global supply from this one thing so you, you, your price assumptions are no good. I haven't exactly been able to source. It wasn't in the documents how much of end supply that they will make up once they get there. So that can be a a huge limiting factor on you know mines that we more traditionally look at if they're going to produce. 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 percent of the market and just blow it out the water. So that that's a sort of detail would caveat it with but the gut my gut feel would be that volatility if the market is big enough wouldn't be anywhere near the same as what we've seen in things like lithium given it's got that additional layer of uh specialty and nature to it so and i'm sure that's added in with how the debt financing has come about and the confidence there and those those various um products that they're producing are all at various stages of maturity in their their markets as well, from from semis to batteries to LED lighting. Some are much newer than than others. There, I mean, the what they're targeting with the with the batteries, for example, they're much more applicable to high energy density batteries, which is what we've seen a bit of a trend away from moving more to LFP batteries as opposed to uh, the the nickel based batteries and MC batteries, which have a higher energy density. JD, after running your youthful but hyper intelligent eye over this HPA up and comer, mate, what do you bloody think of it? You're gonna you're gonna make me blush, Maddie. <laughs> um, so I've got no special insight. I've got to you know say this up front with the tech that they're running and the pricing, and that's they're the they're the differentiating factors here. But I'm fascinated by the company company nevertheless. So. Clearly want to see them lock in more of those letter of intents and ideally better than letter of intents, like secure the pricing around their product. That'll, you know, come in hand with being able to draw down the debt. That'd be a huge tick of approval. And it'd be awesome if, you know, they could say they've done this with a reputable partner, a, a big semiconductor manufacturer or a battery manufacturer, just to give the market or perhaps just to give me confidence in what they're doing and to also vouch for the the tech that they're putting forward. But on the base case, looking through their financials, at steady state, they're, they're indicating 50% free cash flow margin. And, you know, to be clear, that that is sort of monopoly level margins. They are huge. And in mining terms, you know, that's bottom of the lowest quartile type margin. And that's not even the, the mid case or the independent case, which were both price decks higher than the base case. So they've got super attractive financing, but we've seen other companies with very attractive financing that have just, you know, not not quite blown up yet, but ultimately going to need double as much financing as they initially sort of said. So that's not a, a be all and end all. But com compared to other 
mining projects, they don't have that end life, like I said at the beginning. So that's a big check. I know you discount the cash flows down the track quite heavily to bring them back to today, but it's a, it's still a noticeable difference. And they are two years away from producing and about three years away from producing at 90% capacity. So they've got a, a heap of work ahead of them, but I can understand why people are super interested in the company. And I've just got to say, I need to, need to learn a, a lot more about the the end market of the products, but I'm going to be following the announcements as they come in, Maddie. Oh, mate, love your bloody work, mate. I'm I'm really fascinated. I'm yeah. There's geez, I've got more questions than I than I do before, but I'm also a lot more interested. I'm really, really like I find it so curious. Normally, like lenders, even concessional ones like Naif, they they've always historically demanded of you know contracts for, with a floor price, even for sort of niche commodities like. You know, um, or at least that was the case when when NAIF sort of funded any any SOP, for example. There was this, requ- there. yeah, requirement for for floor prices and off take and all that sort of stuff. So I find it really interesting that they've got this sort of con- you know concessional financing environment without, um, yeah, with with with, with, with as little as sort of you know letter of intent kind of kind of arrangements with with with, with uh you know the end use consumer. But that's probably worth yeah. worth looking into for, for myself. Um, I hope it's not the case. They've just got sort of rose tinted glasses because it's a, a a green, if you like, end demand, and that they've done done some serious work on it. It would be a strong like vote of confidence if they could get beyond that letter of intent stage, because we know that they're not always worth the paper that they're they're written on. So that that's the key detail that I'm looking forward coming out hopefully in the in the next few months. Totally. Really uh, interesting. The other bit of homework for you too, mate, is I want to I want to know why are uh, like there's a bunch of like wannabe um, ASX companies with a bit of kaolin, and kaolin is the worst commodity to ever try and produce like, or make money from. Like there's just history is riddled with kaolin failures, um, and now they say that they're developing high purity alumina companies. I want to know if that's a bullshit claim or if there's some some merit to, to that claim because I've I've heard. I've heard both sides. The the default view is that it's bullshit. That's <laughs> proven. <laughs> but we'll look into it, mate. Right. Uh, Our Patriot. Oh, payment raising forty four bucks. Uh, well, forty four to, to ASX investors. But the way it all works with this Canadian flow through financing is, you know, that like PMET will get seventy six million Canadian in the door. Yeah. Um, forty four million. It, it's all this weird flow through tax credit sort of situation, but structured in this funky way. That flow through raising, um, is, you know, essentially gets converted to CDIs, and the JLMs are effectively facilitating a block trade. And um, but yeah, I mean, look, Patriot they had at about Canadian forty six million bucks of cash at thirty first of March, so. We we always ask what's what's the read through? Why did they um why did they need to raise the money, right? God, we should have, as I said, Travis should have seen after that <laughs> bloody Comsec video and everything. The I'm like, oh, you would have known something was going on. Yeah, mate. Uh, oh. God, I'm slow on the uptake. <laughs> um, well, I, and I heard some word on the decline that Canada is set to revamp its flow through finance rules. So the the raise was was maybe opportunistic in and and getting the raise in before those changes come into effect so i thought oh that's a fair enough reason and then then i googled what had been announced in relation to the the flow through shares from the canadian government government and in the budget announced in april they said the tax credit for the flow through shares would be extended for another year through to the march 31st 2025 so i don't know if the rationale really stacks up that you that you you do the raise now because there's still plenty of time before then but um but yeah look the use of funds is flagged for for exploration uh, heck, they the shares were up like fifteen percent last week, I think. So mm. uh, you know, it's probably just opportunistic off of the back of a share price run. Um, but more cash in the door. I'll continue to drill out Corvette. I don't think there's too much to add there, Matty. Mm, do you do you think there's any read through in what they're th- predicting for the future lithium price? If they had forty four bucks already and they're raising now, and they're thinking maybe twelve hundred might be the number for a while. It maybe. Yeah, maybe you probably don't want to let your cash get too low, because then then the market starts to bake in that you come raise and your share price yeah. just dips. But um, maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe 
There's bloody could be. Bloody could be. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, anyway, wonder when it – because when I saw the block trade word, I'm like just – Who sell it? First. Yeah. No, I thought, oh, fuck, that must be the album I'll – Start uh, getting yeah, block yeah. trade, but no, no, it's not. It is not that yet to be determined. What um, what will be happening with Albemarle's? What was it? Five point seven percent or something, or five point four percent of the company. So yet to yet to be determined. Bit bloody, mate. Keeper. Yeah, the, 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 good word on the decline in the newsletter last week. Keep an eye out for bloody Japan and Korea <laughs> with what's going on. I, I have to sign up to find out. Hey, the bloody battle against China. It's all happening, Japan and Korea and the Southeast it, Asian nations. Oh, mate, the other ones. Oh, it's fucking got me eyes peeled. And I was Trav, just, yeah. you, went to the, uh, you went to the Metals X AGM today. The one and only shareholder. Trav, well I did. done, mate. Yeah, ding, ding, ding before I say anything else. Um, and I was the only bloody shareholder that went, mate, like, the only independent shareholder in other than the, the board, some of the board own, own stock, but like the only other people in the room at the AGM, this is a loved stock on Twitter. Like none of those people in real life come to the bloody AGM. What are you doing? That's the weird thing. If a, if a you're the only one that's not anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> but if a company as, you know, quote unquote popular as Metals X gets one shareholder to its AGM, then the, the thought of keeping directors and management accountable at uh, the other 800 non you know big ASX companies is it's pretty mind boggling to think is, that this is this is such low hanging fruit to improve corporate australia is just go to the fucking agms of the companies you own stock in it's such low hanging fruit like um yeah i do think you like the questions you ask at an agm can can actually meaningfully you know, change the way the board will, will make decisions because they'll, they'll feel at the margin a little bit under pressure to do certain things because you ask questions in a certain way. So just and you learn, fucking turn up. And you learn who's fucking running your money. Jeez, I learned a lot about a, <laughs> a board last year when I went to an AGM. You learned that you wanted to sell your shares. <laughs> oh, no, I, need, I just learned that it needed to be changed. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I, I was I was pretty disappointed at the, um, the turnout and I just – I hope, like, like I don't know. I'm, sh- I'm sure we get a bunch of retirees and stuff like this and or watch our show. If you if you got nothing better to do, just make sure you put all the AGMs in your diary and just turn up. Just be like Kev. <laughs> Kev, if you're listening, Kev goes to the AGMs. He goes to all of them. Shout out to Kev. Yeah, it's uh, not much to ask. <laughs> what are, what they talk about, Trav? Yeah, look, there are, any, there are a few any, talking, talking points. points? Uh, there's a lot of Q&A with the audience. <laughs> what, with you? <laughs> yep. <laughs> they, <laughs> they, um, yeah, dress, instead of addressing shareholders, they're like, what's your, what's your name, Travis? Like, everything was just addressed to me from that point on because I was the only person there. Um, but, yeah, look, some, some key talking points I thought it would be worth worth going over. One was on, um, like, so ca- capital returns is the big one with – with Metals X, they got 167 million bucks of cash and they announced this share buyback, which is, you know, like a long time coming, like, you know, distribute this back to shareholders, please. The disappointing thing is that they've only actually, since announcing a buyback for up to 10% of the issued capital of the company, they've actually only spent $374,000 buying back shares, which is basically 10 fifths of fuck all, right? Mm. It's, it's a lot less than 10% of the issued capital of the company and they haven't done... They haven't bought back any shares in, I think, about a month's time. Now, what they said, the AGM, when kind of prompted, was that if the share the share price ran away from them shortly after, mostly due to tin price rather than the, their intention to buy back, um, and if the share price falls you know, below a predetermined um, level, then they'll resume the buyback. Now, I sort of – I pose the question, you know, why not do a dividend, a special dividend as, a, as another way to return – uh, capital to shareholders, and I got a bit of pushback when I said that. But I think collectively there was some reflection that their their capital allocation framework could be improved. Um, but that cash has got to come; like a good portion of that cash needs to come back to shareholders for this, you know, company to be taken seriously. Because the big fear you have as a shareholder is that they're going to waste it; they're going to spend it on something silly, or that their major shareholder, um, you know, has other plans for that cash and. <laughs> and has enough influence to see that cash go to something silly, which isn't in the interest of every other shareholder. So those, that was a kind of line of questioning I was going down. Yeah, right. That, uh, that major shareholder must be awfully confident that they didn't even need to show up to the AGM. 
<laughs> oh, I'm sure they'd represent were you, were you, were you, were you the designated proxy for APAC, Trav? No. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, yeah, I, I no. think they've got enough representation on the, uh, on the board, unlike yeah. other shareholders. And the board were keen to point out some um, errors that we've made in, in the past in our reporting buddy in JD. What was it? Uh, so to come on. they were <laughs> – maybe one day. Maybe they can be convinced. But, um, yeah, some errors in the past. They were keen to dispel the rumour that there's uh, – any connection between, uh, look, a- APAC being a beneficiary of of any offtake in relation to Renaissance Tin Mines? So they basically said, look, um, APAC's commodity trading business does exist, but it's you know never never traded or got anything to do with um, with with tin. So there's no like there's no actual benefit to to APAC for the change of offtake that did did occur um, like in the recent quarterly announced. So. Yeah, they were, they were kind of keen to dispel that rumor. They said they said uh, there were some other factual inaccuracies in the past potentially as well. But um, yeah, there's some, there was some other stuff too that that uh, got brought up. So did they did they talk about rentals as well and any sort of growth out there, mate? Yeah, I mean rentals is a pretty unexciting like uh, tailings retreatment kind of project that they've they've signed posted um, as a as a growth option. It's very uninspiring like project in my opinion. Like like tailings retreatment, come on, um, and big capital outlay for an uninspiring project. Like I um, put the question to them, why don't you just buy Alphamin like shares, and you'll have a higher RRR, and you can increase your bloody you know your tin exposure that way. That, to which they said, we are not a fund. Um, but hang on, they've bought bloody gold shares in the past, which made me think they are a fund. So mm. <laughs> anyway, um, but what about on the on the Cyprian front? We know they've got notes with them. Cyprian's got a little bit of a bid lately. Well, well, just on 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 rentals, I think the real question is like like that they signalled that the um, more interesting way to allocate capital in terms of growth might actually be this expiration front ring rows. I think they've got some challenges with their JV. Um, partner in, in sort of you know accelerating that was the impression I'm, I might have gotten but on yeah and then on 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 Cyprium so they've got these like convertible notes they wrote down the value of them in their latest annual report from 30, 36 million dollar face value to 14 million bucks um, it's sort of like up to metals X to you know put the put the knife to the throat there which it sounds like they're gonna they've got a view of wanting to keep Cyprium out of receivership, but that means they'll, they'll be taking a haircut in some way, shape, or form, and they have to renegotiate that TBA there. Talked about M&A a little bit as well. And I think that's the question. Are they are they going to be more interested in, in um, bolt-on acquisitions versus, you know, like just r- r- ring rows and what's the timing of all that? And to be honest, I don't know. But the whole – the big risk in all of this, right, is that they blow the money, like I said. And, I, like, my view on that didn't, didn't change from the AGM. Like, I got to ask questions, got to meet the board, got to – you know, see how they responded to a lot of things. But uh, but when you look at the fact that of the cash that they are building rapidly, only three hundred and seventeen or three hundred seventy four thousand dollars of that has actually gone to shareholder returns via buyback. I'm not left like feeling very confident that there is a real priority on distributing the cash to shareholders. Um, so I, I advocate that they introduce a proper capital allocation framework, something which says like, okay. Our capital allocation framework looks at our cash like this, and we will we will ensure that the uh, minimum of forty percent of uh, free free cash flow or NPAT goes to shareholders every um, every half year by way of a dividend. Like that's that to me is a proper capital allocation framework, not this you know loose. We will maybe do a buyback if we feel like it. it it's <laughs> yeah, essentially yeah. nothing. That that money that they've you know so far put in place is less than 02 percent of the cash on hand. Yeah, they as essentially a, haven't put any sort of capital returns into practice yet. As a as a shareholder, mm. would you rather a buyback or a dividend? No, I th- I, th- I can understand why they pause the buyback because you're like, okay, you know, we only want to buy our shares when we think there's a discount to intrinsic value. Share prices run, blah 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 blah. But in light of that, issue a special dividend and still pay out, you know, the the quantity that you'd signalled of the cash to be. To go out the door, do a special dividend. I think there's some tax advantages to doing a dividend, um, but yeah, that's. I, I don't really care. Just do it one way or the other. Just don't hoard the cash and spend it on something that you know doesn't deserve for the cash to go to, mm. <laughs> which is my fear. <laughs> yes, especially how thin t- M and A on tin would be. Yeah, like yeah. 
unless they well, you, you fear they're going to go outside ten. Totally, I fear yeah. I fear that big time. Yeah, or I fear they'll just hoard cash, you know, ad infinitum. Which um, again, like I'm not, I don't own equity to earn interest at the bank. You know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. What bloody metals X? What do you know about HPA? Apparently, it's the next big thing, according to JD. <laughs> Imagine if they threw it into HPA or kale and trap. <laughs> Jesus Christ, that'd that'd make that next gen rant look like a friggin' uh, very calm presentation. <laughs> 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 oh, bloody good work, lads. Bloody good. It's always good to be back on a Monday. Fucking wake get Sunday sinking me last couple of tins. It's like I'm, it's like I'm, it's like the day before fly out day, but I want to go to work. <laughs> Very different. So, so it's the opposite. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Complete opposite. Still sinking <laughs> tins, but. Uh, right, thanks to all Love the it. bloody partners. Who'd we have in there? I always say who we have in the show, but. Who did we have in the show? CRE yes. Insurance Ooh. and, and Silverstone. Silverstone. Jesus, aren't they yep. extremely important to the mining industry? We have just clarified. Who are other important people? Verify, get wet solutions. DSI Underground. Oh, yeah, extremely important. WA Waterboards, Brooks Airways, and Bloody K Drill. Who to row? Who money miners? The information contained in this episode of Money of Mine is of general nature only and does not take into account the objectives, financial situation or needs of any particular person. Before making any investment decision, you should consult with your financial advisor and consider how appropriate the advice is to your objectives, financial situation and needs.